following the surprising interest in my last video where I shared my journey with the Leica cameras. I thought in this video I will elaborate to give you a bigger picture of what's actually going on. It's not purely down to Leica. I'll probably title this video something like why I change cameras every week. <laughs> it certainly feels like that at the moment. I will explain, I promise. Let's get into the video. So if you've seen this channel over the last three months, you may remember end of December, January, where I suddenly bought the Leica M10. Then in February, I accidentally bought a Nikon SLR camera. Suddenly the Nikon SLR cameras were the best thing ever. And then again, unexpectedly in March, I bought a 4x5 camera. And what happened? <laughs> 35mm completely stopped and I'm shooting all 4x5. So what's what's going on? It's like, Matt, what are you smoking? This isn't normal behaviour, please explain. Okay, so I will try and explain. So if we step back to December, I think the December incident, <laughs> aka the like M10, I think I was researching a video for you guys. And sometimes when I search videos, I need to check the prices of current cameras so I can tell you camera A costs this, camera B costs this. And I accidentally saw a very reasonably priced, slightly marked like M10, the one that you've seen in, seen me hold in previous videos. And it was only slightly more expensive than a mint like M240. So I'm no fool. I'm like, Matt, this is too good not to, not to mess up. So find some money from somewhere and buy this camera. Work it out after. <laughs> so basically I bought the like M10. That was end of December. I was then loving the M10, doing my videos as normal, two videos every week. And then someone out of the blue contacted me knowing that I love Leica stuff and said, hey Matt, I've got a few lenses I'm selling, would you be interested? Oh, and I've also got a Nikon F3. I'm like, hmm, a Nikon F3. I've got a Nikon F4 and a Nikon F5, but I've never actually tried a Nikon F3 and I've heard amazing things about the Nikon F3. And then the thing that pinched it for me, not only was the price great, but also it came with a waist level viewfinder and none of my Nikon cameras, I don't think, any of my 35mm cameras at all, I've got a waist level viewfinder. I was like, oh, that would be a completely different shooting experience. It'd be like shooting a Hasselblad or a TLR and it's where you look down instead of looking at like eye level. But the beauty of loading it with 35mm film, so you get obviously a lot more photos on every roll of film. So I'm like, hmm, that sounds too good not to mess up. So I'm like, okay, bye. Then I did research for the Nikon F3 and I kind of looked more and more and more. And then that led to the Nikon F3T. That then led to the Nikon FM3A. And so the more you learn as a photographer, the kind of the more dangerous it gets because you realize the pros and cons of different models and kind of the maybe best values out there. And you start looking for deals and it, disaster happens. <laughs> Gear acquisition syndrome kicks in and the rabbit hole just opens up and like sucks you in. I'm sure, I'm sure you've been there and you can relate to it. Uh, feel free to comment below if you've fell down the like a rabbit hole or any other rabbit hole. These holes f seem more like, I don't know, <laughs> Grand Canyon holes, the ones that I fall down. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so that's what happened with Nikon. So everything was good. I was like, cool, I'm going to shoot Nikon. And so I bought fresh 35mm film. I was like, great, I'm going to have it all really simple. I'm going to shoot my Leica 35mm cameras. Then alongside that, I'll shoot my Nikon 35mm film cameras. Everything is great. And then I did the video, 20 cameras I will never sell. And in the comments on that video, you guys told me the cameras that you wouldn't sell and one of the top voted cameras that you would not sell, like your favourite cameras, was the 4x5 Linhoff camera. You can see where this is going. So I started doing research, ooh, Linhoff camera, that sounds good. That led me to cheaper alternatives, which is the MPP British camera, which is a bit like a speed graphic, the late MPPs basically like a Linhoff clone, but at much, much more affordable prices. And I just happened to Google it and I found one in the UK. It's a great price for analog cameras. Shout out to Dan, awesome guy. That then led me to buying a MPP because again, it seemed too good a price to, to miss up. And I already owned 4x5 kit from like eight years ago. And then that just opened up this absolutely huge hole of 4x5 world that I wasn't really prepared for. And so if you've seen any of my recent videos, I've been shooting 4x5 and I'm just so inspired by 4x5 and just loving everything 4x5. As soon as I think I've got somewhere, something just comes out of the blue, totally like sends me off on a total different tangent. And then we go again. 
So I'm going to share some graphs as we get into the video, but if you can relate to this, hopefully you can. Hopefully it's not just me. Uh, please do let us know in the comments. But I do feel that it's better to try to just follow your heart. And if something comes along as bases like Matt, come over here and take photos with this camera. And then you go that way. And then it's like, Matt, come over here and take use this camera. And so my path for photography seems to be going like this all over the place from camera to camera to camera to system to system to system. But the great thing I'm kind of finding all purely by accident, because none of this is planned, is as I jump from system to system, I'm learning so much that I can then relate back to all the systems combined. So I've learned so much from 4x5 that I can relate to 35mm. I've learned so much from Nikon that I can relate to Leica. So with that, hopefully this will be the bit of the video which is hopefully useful for you guys. I'm going to go through points I've learned from each of the three systems I've used in the last three months and hopefully you can have some useful takeaways for your own photography and yeah hopefully it just shows you that it doesn't really matter what camera you use as long as you're kind of always learning and always enjoying it your photography is going to get better 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 and again I'll try and draw a graph at the end the snowball effect. Yeah with that let's get into the facts. The first thing I learnt with the like M10 is black is better than silver if you want to be more discreet in the street. It sounds really obvious and you hear it all the time, but it's not until you physically go from having a silver camera around your neck, say with a silver lens, to ideally a black camera around your neck with a black strap and a black lens. And suddenly it's like, uh, excuse me, am I invisible here? <laughs> because people just look at silver cameras so much more. Black cameras with small black lenses are so much more stealthy and kind of discreet for street photography. So obviously it doesn't need to be Leica. Number two, again with the M10, I love how a small camera just lets you have a camera on you all the time and just, I had it like across me on like a, a neck strap under my coat. And it's the first time I've worn a camera like that for street photography. And with a really small lens on, like a little Scopar lens or a little um, 40 more Helia lens, I've always had a camera in a bag rather than across me. And so you do miss a lot more shots when you don't wear your camera and you bag your camera instead. I mentioned this in a previous video. Number three, if you're a Leica M film shooter and you never feel you're quite fast enough to get your shots, if you've got the funds to do so, try to invest in a used Leica digital M camera because it's basically the same experience shooting with a digital M as a film M, except the digital M is free. The film M, you've obviously got to feed it with film and that costs money. For that reason, once you get good at shooting with a digital M, it's going to be an instant transfer of skills to your film M and you better get more keeper shots with say your like a M6 for example. And number four, if you saw my fun video where I shot in Gdansk, I now appreciate bad weather makes good photos. In the past, I would say I'm definitely a fair weather photographer. I love the sun, I love dry, warmer weather, and I really don't like grey rain. But after getting caught in like a, a snowstorm in Poland with my Leica M10, I didn't fully appreciate how amazing bad weather is to make great photos. So that was definitely a takeaway from that video. Okay, next camera. Okay, Nikon. What did I learn with my Nikon SLR cameras that I can transfer to other cameras as well? Number one, waist level viewfinders are so much fun. If you've got the chance, I highly recommend it. It's a completely different shooting experience if you're kind of scared of eyeballing your subject by looking down to your camera. It's much easier to do street photos in those situations. And if you're like a digital shooter and use an M camera, if you use an EVF, you can pop your EVF to look straight down. And then it's the same as shooting with a waist level viewfinder. Number two, I think my biggest takeaway and enjoyment from using the Nikon SLR cameras, the F3 in particular, was the enjoyment from using a long lens. So I was using a 180mm f2.8 Nikon lens and that lens is so much fun for street photography. I think people often overlook that you can actually use a telephoto lens for street photography because it just gives you such good compression if you're in a city where you have like nice long streets. New York and things come to mind anywhere. Any city which has got a grid system, 180 miles is good, but you could go even longer. Or you could use a telephoto, a teleconverter and make a lens longer than it normally would be. And then for Leica shooters, 
I think again, M users obviously overlook the fact that yes, M lenses are great, but you can also use Leica R lenses. And like R lenses, you can get zooms and telephotos. So I've got the 80 to 200 R lens F4. So yeah, don't overlook long lenses, even as a Leica shooter. Number three, now Sonos use Leica cameras for the last 10 plus years, as you saw in the last video. I'm used to the feeling of having a Leica around my neck. Now, in certain situations, you might not want to go down a particular street if you've got a Leica on you. Whereas what I learned from Nikon is you can then go to the same street and take a cheap camera. It doesn't need to be a Nikon. Any cheap camera, which is lower value and lower risk. And so you can feel comfortable and focus on taking the photos rather than worrying about your camera. And suddenly you can enjoy photography again in maybe less desirable places and still hope to get some great pictures. It doesn't matter if you have a Leica for your nice days out and maybe a cheap Minolta or Nikon for your sketchy days out, <laughs> sketchy location days out. You'll still get great photos from both cameras. It just means you don't have to worry so much if you're using your latest M11 with Noctilux or whatever. So when I went to Lisbon the second time I had um, Nikon cameras, you get noticed less with a cheaper camera. And number five, I saw it again with the Leica experience. Once you go to Nikon, you notice a few problems with Nikon compared to Leica. Number one, if you like small, fast glass, Leica or any rangefinder lenses are still smaller and I would say sharper at the widest aperture compared to SLR lenses. Modern Leica lenses are sharp, wide open, whereas most lenses, especially vintage lenses, need to be stopped down at least one stop to get decent sharpness. Most lenses improve a lot once you stop it down one stop. So for this reason, if I'm shooting nickel, nickel lenses, or fast nickel lenses, I'd normally have to shoot them at say f2, f2.8 to get decent sharpness. Now the beauty of shooting with Leica lenses is you can shoot 1.4 all day long and still get amazing photos. That's why you pay the huge premium if you want to get something like a 1.4 similar for example. And number six relating to that, one of my frustrations with the Nikon cameras is even if you've got an amazing lens, which just happens to be sharp at f1.4, where you focus through the ground glass with an SLR camera, the glass is not accurate enough to focus at a 1.2 lens or a 1.4 lens. The focus screens of Nikon or any SLR cameras, nearly all the screens are only accurate from maybe f2, f2.8. So even if you're shooting a lens that's f1.4, you may miss focus at 1.4, which seems to hold true from some of my experience. So that's a huge drawback if you want to shoot film in low light with a Nikon camera because there's no point having a 1.4 lens if you need to stop it down to f2 to get accurate focus. Okay, next, my learning from large format. Now, before you all click off, I know large format is really, really niche, but before you log off, bear with me because I really think you can learn from this. I've learned so much in the last month. I think I said in my latest newsletter, I've learned more in the last 30 days than I think I've learned in the last three years, purely because of the film format that I'm using. So I'm going to go through a list and yeah, see how many of these you can relate to. I'm pretty sure you can relate these to almost any camera. It doesn't need to be large format. Okay, number one, as mentioned, as I'm normally a 35mm shooter, uh, sometimes 120 film, medium format, I often shoot handheld. So I do own tripods, but I've never really given them much thought. That's not until you start shooting with bigger cameras that tripods suddenly become of interest and of importance. So the first thing large format taught me is number one, have a tripod which is ideally the same height as you without the center extension extended. And so that makes it much more steady. And also it's more comfortable to have a, a tripod up to here for me, for example. So I'm like this and not kind of bending down, booking my knees, trying to focus for half an hour, give myself a bad back. The second thing is of importance other than the height is obviously the material, aluminium versus carbon fiber. They both have their benefits and also how many leg extensions. So if it's like a four or five extension, it's going to go really compact, but it's going to take longer to set up and it's often smaller. If it's like a three extension, they tend to be bigger and so less ideal for travel, but faster to set up and more stable, it seems. There's even tripods with this like ball thing in the middle where you just like, I've seen it in other videos, I can't think of the name, 
quote below if you know the one I'm talking about. And so you can basically level your tripod straight away with this like ball in the middle of the top of the legs. And then that brings me on to number two, tripod heads. Now again, I've never really given this much thought. I think I thought there's probably two sorts, a ball head, which is like a normal one, like a ball in a socket, which is what I've always really used, and a um, like a hinge head, which tend to be a bit smaller, which I had on one of my monopods. There's actually a third one. So the problem with ball heads is you put your camera on and then the way the camera makes it sag after you've tightened it up and it's so frustrating. And so for this, you need a gear head. Now a gear head is what it sounds. It's got gears and so you can like precisely turn up a knob and it moves your camera up, down, left, right, whatever. This is so rewarding. It's like having a Leica version of a tripod head and it doesn't need to be expensive. I can put a link to the one that I use below, but it's just so much less frustration than every time you tighten up your tripod your camera sags number three photo apps i mentioned this in a recent video so i won't go into too much detail but there are a huge amount of very useful photo apps you can get free or for a small price on the iphone app um shop thing <laughs> things like the bubble, bubble spirit level you've got like sun tracker devices you've got viewfinder devices you've got light meter devices and you've got uh, reciprocity calculators for shooting and filming low light. See the video I shot in Budapest for more details and examples of each, but it's just things you never really think about until you come to shoot film with a certain camera and then you're like, ah, oh, I wonder what this is. Oh, I wonder if my camera's, my camera's level. I forgot to bring my spirit level. Oh, I've got my phone. And so there's so many useful things on your phone that you can make use of if you don't have all the individual tools like a, an individual light meter. Number four, I've only just really started to appreciate the artistic benefits of using motion in your pictures. So again, I've, sh I've always really shot handheld, uh, often with handheld, like small Leica cameras. And so I didn't need tripods and I froze motion with my shutter, also with flash. Suddenly once you start using tripods, if you need to use a long shutter speed to get the correct exposure, let's say the, the building's sharp, but the wind may have made the leaves blow or the people going past blur and suddenly you've got a combination of sharp and motion in the same picture and it just suddenly brings so much more dynamic elements to the image this is real kind of big one for me start to use more motion in my pictures to add a bit more interest number five one big reason why i think many people may look to get into four by five or large format is the ability to change your plane of focus so you can adjust your focus plane in the photo to direct the viewer to where we want them to look. So let's say you want to take a photo of a portrait, me for example, if I tend, normally if I'm straight onto the camera, my glasses and my eyes will be sharp because it's the same plane as of focus as you guys, if you are the camera. If I turn to the side with a shallow depth of field, I can have my near eye in focus and my second eye blurred. With a large format camera, you turn the plane of focus in the camera, the same plane as the face, and then you can have both eyes sharp. Now, as I say, 4x5 is king for this, but there are hacks that will allow you to do it with other cameras. You could use things like a lens baby lens, which lets you tilt your lens. You could free lens your own lenses. I won't go into the detail, but you basically take a lens and put it in front of your camera sensor, handhold it and bend it to change your plane of focus. You could use tilt shift lenses, or you could even use something like the Rollerflex SL66, which allows you to tilt every lens on that camera. I've done a video on that before, amazing camera. Number six, another good reminder for me was the fact that you can use Rodinol or Rodinol to develop your negatives, both black and white and a color. If you're doing darkroom prints like I've started to do and you want to get more sharpness in your prints, they say by using one to 100 Rodinol, you get sharper prints because it's a high acuteness developer, point number one. And then point number two, if you've got some vintage color film, you can actually develop any C41 film in black and white chemistry, such as Rodinol, and then you'll get black and white images, but you'll have a much higher chance of recovering your image if, say, you did the wrong exposure when shooting your colour film. Again, I did that recently in my um, shooting my 30-year-old film video. Number, what we are, number seven. It sounds obvious, but I'm glad that it holds true regardless of your camera format. So as you know, I love my vintage lenses on my Leica cameras, but now I've started playing with 4x5 
I can tell you that it, the same is exactly true for larger formats. So I've got some modern 4x5 lenses and I've started to try to buy a few vintage 4x5 lenses and yeah, guess, guess it's ones I like the best. The vintage 4x5 lenses are <laughs> absolutely amazing and I can't wait to share more photos with you. I know it's not like it, but I really hope you can join me on my 4x5 journey because I really think this is my chance to get closer to the direction I'm trying to go to try to make art from my photography. Number eight, number eight filters. Again, I think because I've used Leica cameras for so long, I tend to keep it really simple. Or maybe I'll use a yellow filter on a blue sky day to get a bit more definition in the clouds. But for models, I tend to use no filters at all. And it's not until you start shooting non-models that you start to use more filters and then things just get really interesting really quick. Things like neutral density filters, grad filters, where you have like a dark bit over the sky. You've got circular polarizing filters. You then got color filters to enhance the contrast. A yellow will give you slightly more contrast. Orange, a bit more contrast. Red filters, even more contrast on like a, a gray day. Almost any photo will benefit from using a filter. Now, number nine. This is probably one I'm very guilty of as a model photographer. But there's no point having interesting lenses if you're going to shoot it against a blank wall. You're not going to get bokeh from a studio backdrop or white wall backdrop. And so I think I need to keep telling myself it's not always possible because it's always <laughs> beeping raining <laughs> in the UK. But if you've got interesting lenses or see vintage lenses in particular, that maybe give that nice swirl or the nice bokeh, you won't get bokeh inside against, as I say, studio backgrounds you need to take those lenses out and then you can start to see the true potential from the lenses i'm like bashing myself over the head to remind myself of this because now i'm shooting large format as well you really don't get the special like wow look from large format if you're going to shoot against a white wall it's easy to shoot inside because it's easy as like a glamour photographer if you want them to wear like i don't know lingerie or whatever to just stand in your in your studio less easy if you're trying to do that in the high street in london <laughs> so you obviously you need to dress them accordingly or find a uh, appropriate location now number 10 i don't know if you like me but in the modern fast-paced world i always feel like i'm go 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 when you start using large format cameras it's a much slower process so it takes more time to set up it takes more time to focus it takes more time to check your composition everything takes more time and as cheesy as this may sound slowing down actually makes you enjoy the day more and enjoy the the location i think in the past i've always been like go 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 with uh, fast 35 mil handheld cameras i can focus fast i can compose fast onto the next place onto the next place next model bang 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 well, and then when i was shooting in the woods recently with the uh, one of the four by five cameras i'm like huh this is actually really nice and it, it, it suddenly lets you absorb your surroundings a lot more and that brings me on to my first bonus point. Nature or being in nature is really relaxing and a really good way to recharge if you're go, go, go or we just kind of standing in the woods and listening to the birds sing. It's, it's more re uh, recharging than you can probably imagine. Bonus point number two, I always thought was a patient person, but I've realised after shooting with large format, I really am not a patient person when it comes to the weather. And so if you've got a day where you've got lots of clouds and tiny breaks for sunshine, you could wait as long as an hour to get your photo. And that's so counterintuitive to me. I just want to like get it done <laughs> and on to the next one. So 4x5 is teaching me to slow down and enjoy the day more. On a positive note, the birds are singing. Bonus point number three, enjoy the finer details. So if you're like me, you normally look at a, a broad scene and you're like, uh, let's say you get to your local forest. You're like, uh, it's a forest, it looks, it looks a bit rubbish, it looks a bit boring. How can I make a photo of this? And then you get down onto like your knees and, and you look down at some, I don't know, broken log and you'll see this like tiny mushroom sticking up or growing through the bark. And you're like, huh, there's a really great photo there. So by concentrating on the finer details, you can make amazing pictures from what may look like a bland scene on days where the weather's not great for big scene landscape photography i think find that detail shot landscape photography bonus point number four 
simple can be really fun. Now, as we know, cameras are just a light type box, lens on one end, sensor or film on the other end. Now, you don't really appreciate how simple that is until you shoot maybe say pinhole cameras, which I've not yet done, but I know many people do. Uh, comment below if you shoot pinhole. Or if you use a vintage lens on a 4x5 camera, where you have no shutter in the lens, no shutter in the camera body. So the only way to basically correct, control your exposure is put the cap on the lens, take the cap off, let some light into your film, put the cap back on again. And it's like, in your head, it's like, this is never ever gonna work. And it does, it worked, and like I, I got some nice pictures. And so it really does kind of drum home the simplicity of what photography is actually about when you use a really super simple camera, such as 4x5 or pinhole cameras, for example. And bonus point number five for any of you still awake, just use the camera that inspires you to go out on that day. If you wake up and you're like, hmm, I feel like a like an M3 day today, you can go and do some fast paced photography. If you wake up and go, oh, I feel like a long lens SLR day today, like, right, go and do some long lens photography. Or if you want to slow right down and enjoy the whole day, and maybe you just want to take two or three pictures, you can even shoot four by five. <laughs> and so with that, let's quickly cover my graphs. So the first graph is my wiggly line graph. So I think of this as your progression line. So here is your beginner at the bottom, and at the top is your best of the best expert pro level photographer. You start with one camera, and then you lose inspiration and you feel like you're hitting a wall and you stop learning, you stop taking photos. Some people might do this like me with my Nikon D800. I just wasn't enjoying digital photography anymore. And then luckily I did some research on Flickr and I've discovered film cameras and it was a lot of Russian and Ukrainian photographers at the time taking really beautiful portraits with cheap Russian cameras, film cameras. And so I'd hit that wall and then that spurred me off on a tangent to film. And so then my tangent for film went past my wall and I progressed further up the, up the line. I then hit a tangent again when I think 35mm, I was like, I wanted more for my negatives and I was, I was feeling I could get all I could for my small 35mm negatives. And then I was like, did some reading and like, oh, medium format, medium format, maybe the magic bullet answer. So I like tangent off again and then progressed further again. And then the same thing happened with 4x5 cameras. I went off on a tangent and progressed again. And it doesn't need to be purely on sensor size. It might be you start off with a Leica and then you find you're too slow at using it for street photography. And so you get yourself a Fuji, what they call a Ricoh GR3 or one of these super fast point and shoot cameras. That might be what inspires you to do your style of photography. And that might be what inspires you to have the confidence to do better street photography or approach strangers. And every single time you progress past the next wall, you're gonna get better, 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 better as a photographer. So that's graph number one. Hopefully you can relate to it and it makes sense for my little drawing. And then graph number two is a snowball effect. So the way I look at it is if the if life is on a very gradual sloping down, it needs to be for my snowball effect to work. It probably feels like a, an upward slope for many of us at times. You start up as a small snowball, you're rolling very slowly forward, which is your progress. As you progress, you absorb more the, the, the more you travel, and so then your snowball gets bigger. As the snowball gets bigger, the weight of the snowball starts to travel faster, so you gain momentum and you learn more and your photography is progressing faster, faster, faster because of the information that you're absorbing on a weekly basis or monthly basis. And so this really relates to my last 30 days of shooting 4x5. I've progressed from a medium snowball to a slightly larger snowball in the last 30 days and I feel I've learned so much purely from playing around with these old cameras. And you don't need a 4x5 camera, you just need anything that inspires you to keep learning and keep reading and keep being inspired to take more and more and more pictures and then the more we do it the better we get. As always a huge thanks to my amazing patrons and I will share a few recent videos to watch next that you may have missed because they were marked 4x5 and you're like I don't want to watch 4x5. Hopefully it'll inspire you to do photography with your camera regardless that I was using a 4x5 camera.